If you have a wood gasifier stove like this and you want to know how to set it up and use it correctly because most YouTube videos on the subject don't show the correct way, then keep watching. If you're keen to maximise your outdoor times by improving your bushcraft and outdoor skills, then hit that subscribe button and let me take care of the rest. Cheers. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you'll have seen me use this stove on a handful of occasions in the past. But it's always kind of been in the background. It's always kind of been the fact that I'm cooking on it whilst doing something else in the video. I've seen so many YouTube videos that talk about this stove and demonstrate the use of this stove incorrectly and inefficiently that I thought it was time to put together a video that purely focused on this stove, how it works, how it differs to other similar looking types of stoves and how you can very, very easily, just by changing the way that you set this up, guarantee that it will work more efficiently for you in the future. So let's get stuck into it. Let's talk about this stove and how it differs from other similar looking stoves that are often called twig stoves. Now don't get me wrong, this burns twigs. You're gonna see that later on in the video. So from that concept, it's exactly the same. The way that this differs though is the efficiency around how it burns it. Let's just get rid of that for a second. Think about the twig box stoves that you are used to seeing that have become very popular. You put your twigs in them, you ignite those twigs, the twigs burn, the twigs give off heat, that heat heats up the vessel or the, the cooking utensil and it cooks your food, it boils your water, etc. It's just like a traditional campfire in that respect, but it's much smaller and much more contained and, and, you know, and more efficient. The only heat that is coming off of that stove though is the heat from the fuel being burnt itself. So it's got kind of one heat source if you like. Compare that to this type of stove. Now you still load twigs and small pieces of wood, again you'll see it later on in the video, into this type of stove. You still do that. Those twigs still burn. That, that those flames give off the heat and they heat the cooking utensil. So no difference there. The way that this works though, is that this area here, that I'm moving my finger around, that is actually a double wall construction. If I allow you to look inside, if we can pick that up in there, you may just be able to see on the inner wall, some small vents, some small holes. The reason you can't see any daylight on the other side, there you go, that's better. The reason you can't see any daylight on the other side of those holes, or you can't see me through them, is because it's a double wall construction. This is a double wall. When this is burning, when this has your twigs and wood inside it and it's burning, air is drawn in through these holes at the bottom. It would sit on the ground like that. Air is drawn in through the holes at the bottom. That air is, is, is driven upwards and is sucked upwards by the heat caused within the, within the flame that's burning in here. The air is drawn up through here into these inner walls and the air flows out of those small holes that you can see there. By the time the air gets there, it's really hot, really, really hot. The air comes out, it hits your standard flames and is ignited. You'll see all of this later on in the video. You've now got two heat sources. You've got the fuel that is actually being burnt, the flames from the wood, but you've also got that super hot air that's being ignited. And when you see this later on, it looks a little bit like a gas ring on a hob, the way that air flows out and is ignited. Of course, on this occasion, it's not gas, it's, it's air that's flowing out. So you've got two heat sources, same amount of wood, similar type of size stove, but instead of getting one burn, you're getting two burns. So from that perspective, same amount of fuel, twice the burn though. For, from a, an efficiency perspective, wouldn't it make sense to utilize a stove that does that over just a twig type of stove? The purpose of this video isn't to do a comparison between the two. I don't own a twig stove, so it would be unfair of me to do that. What I do wanna show though, is how to set this up correctly so that you are able to maximize that secondary burn. So a little bit of physics, 
I use the word physics very loosely, a little bit of physics tucked away there, a little bit of physics on how this actually works. And you'll see that in just a few moments time. But I just wanted to go through that now so that it kind of makes sense. What I'm about to do next will make sense to you. Look at the fuel that I'm going to use. One of the great things about this stove is just how little fuel you need to get a good, hot, prolonged burn. This is a small, dead standing, um, I think it was a sycamore, Acer Pseudo Platanus sapling. This is the base of it where I chopped it down. If we just look at the diameter of that against my thumb, it's, it's, it's probably thumb thickness, maybe a fraction thicker than that. It's probably around, I'm six foot two, I know it's gone out of shot, but it's probably around seven to eight feet tall. It's dead standing, it was, it was rotting, it was leaning to one side, it had lost its position in the ground. This will give me enough fuel for this video. It'll also give me enough fuel to cook a, uh, an omelette that I've brought out for demo in this video, and probably enough to heat up some water for a hot chocolate as well. From one sapling, one dead standing sapling that's only thumb thickness at the base, just imagine trying to get an open fire going that is gonna be hot enough and prolonged enough and contained enough and efficient enough to cook an omelette and make yourself a hot drink. I don't think it's impossible, but it, it would be some going to be able to do that. And clearly you're also leaving a mark on the environment when you've done that. And as you'll see with this stove, zero signature once it's finished. Or zero signature that can't easily be dispersed once it's finished. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this down into really short sections. The sections are gonna be really short because if you remember a few minutes ago when I showed you those small air vents, those air holes that I was pointing to that said the air flows out of there, this should not obscure those air holes. Just think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to allow air to come out to ignite. The last thing you wanna do is obscure them by the fuel uh, blocking them. So these need to be really, really short lengths. Once you've cut one to size and it's the right length, just use that as a template and go along the entire sapling, cutting everything else to that length. And then you won't have any that are, that are taller or shorter than the others. If it takes me 90 seconds to chop this down into enough fuel to load that stove at the correct length, I'd be incredibly surprised. Really, really fast. Once you've got a, a piece of dead standing to use, really fast to section it up, process it down to fit inside that stove. As with so many things related to fire lighting and successful camp cooking, preparation is the key. So whilst the stove is prepped, ready to go, I'm just going to use a simple lighter to ignite the birch bark. I've also got the skillet to hand. I've got the butter in the skillet. I've got my eggs for my omelette that I whipped up and placed into a small plastic container ready to go. I don't want to be wasting any of the heat from this stove because whilst it is, a, whilst it is an efficient stove, you've seen in there, it's not the world's endless supply of fuel. So once that starts burning, I want the skillet on, I want the butter melting. As soon as that's done, I want the eggs on. I don't want to be looking through my bag. So I've got everything lined up good to go. As I've said, I'm not going to go for any sort of weird and wonderful and overtly bushcrafty techniques there. I'm just going to light this birch bark with a lighter, sit back, let the flame take and get the skillet on. Let's go. just at the point where the heavens start to open as well, just to make it a little bit trickier. I'm gonna place that on top, one to hold the skillet, but also just to protect it from some wind whilst that initial flame catches. Seems to be burning well. I 
know whether you can see him shut or not, but funny old thing, once the food's put an appearance in, so is the dog. So she's come to a she's come to monitor things. Seems to have a steady burn going there. Some of the smaller twigs have ignited. I'm not gonna faff around bringing the camera over and, and waste time, but birch bark's going well. Some of the smaller twigs are going well as well. So at that point, I'm gonna get this on, make the most of that initial heat to melt the butter. I'm still gonna keep checking inside to make sure that those small twigs have caught, that the bigger fuel is caught, otherwise we're gonna be sat here a long time waiting for this butter to melt with nothing more than the air temperature around it. So I wanna keep checking, but only briefly, just by doing that. Yep, looking good. And placing the butter back on again. Once the butter's melted, we'll get started with the eggs. Meanwhile, back at the hot plate, whilst I've been waiting for this butter to melt, which you can clearly see it's done, it's fizzling away nicely there. I've just made myself, uh, I've just prepped a mug full of cold water, hot chocolates to hand again, using any sort of dead time I can to do some concurrent activity to make the most of the fuel that's in this stove. You've noticed that that knob of butter there has now melted down nicely. And again, I'm not going to lift the stove up for obvious reasons. I'm also not going to bring the camera over because of wasting time. But fuel's burning away nicely there. I don't know whether you can make out, and I'm, again, I'm not going to move things around, but the flames are actually coming out from the side of the wall, like I mentioned they would earlier on. Those air vents looks a little bit like a gas flame, doesn't it? As well as the actual wood fuel, uh, the wood fuel burning itself as well. So let's pop that on there for a few more seconds, just to get it nice and hot. Get a little bit too much butter in there, so I'm going to throw a little bit on the ground. There we go. Dog immediately dispatched to check that out. Just a couple of eggs in there. I think three eggs, some salt and pepper. It's just an old plastic container, but it's very, very sturdy. It's very tough. It has a good twist lock mechanism on the top. I just cracked them into there this morning, along with some salt and pepper give them a sort of a last minute whisk and shake now and then let's get that onto the skillet. Hopefully you can pick up on the screen there, that's starting to bubble away nicely, starting to already sort of solidify around the edges so there's some good heat in that skillet, as skillets are good at doing, keeping and retaining the heat. And just to the side here, I've got some pre-chopped up and pre-grated cheese and ham in a bag, good to go. Clearly I've left it in the bag for, for canine reasons. She's just out of camera shot now, at least I think she is, monitoring what's going on. They'll be popped on top of the omelette very shortly. But again, it's about doing as much as I can in preparation for the next stage so that I'm not wasting any of the fuel and any of heat from this stove. This is cooking off nicely now. Now I've built up some nice heat in this skillet, it's keeping it there. Bloody heavy things, as you'll know if you've got one or ever used one, but very, very good at the heat. Again, it's, you know, they're heavy to carry. They're quite expensive, they're heavy to carry. But actually, if you think about it from an efficiency perspective, they're very, very good at, at capturing and holding and retaining the heat of something. So you could possibly cook something quicker or for longer because you don't need as much fuel because the, the actual skillet itself is, is doing a lot of the, the heat retention and heat distribution. But clearly that's a trade-off with the, the cost of them potentially and the bloody weight of them definitely. Okay, that's definitely almost cooked though. A little bit of egg yolk still runny, but it's still got a little while to cook yet. So I'm gonna pop the old cheese and ham on top there. Oh, dropped a little bit there, don't worry. I'm sure I know where that will end up once I've moved away from the flames. Oh, she's coming into shot now, there we go. Just watch yourself, otherwise you're gonna be going back a little singed. Singed Labrador. Go on then, let me move it for you. There you go. Find it. Good girl. Oh, 
Oh, that cheese is melting nice. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, that's almost done. So if you'll join me in just a second over at, at the dining tree. Let's do the taste test. There we have it, the proof's in the pudding, or the omelette as it were. Stove still burning away brilliantly. Probably the best performance I've seen is I've just looked in. The fuel, the thick fuel, the thumb thickness fuel, it's barely charred. I mean, it is charred, that's where the heat's coming from, but there's still a lot of it left. I'm incredibly confident that I can get my hot chocolate out of that. And if I was to really push it and I was quick on my feet, I could probably get another omelette and another hot chocolate out of that. So if I was cooking for two people, really cover it. The, the rate of the burn at the moment, it might speed up, um, suggests I could, I could easily get two meals out of that. And that's because it's been loaded in such a way and burnt and processed in such a way that the only time I have to take anything, the, the cooking utensil off the stove, is to change the cooking utensil, is to take it off to eat, is to put it on to cook and take it off to drink. I'm not having to take it off to put fuel in haphazardly, inefficiently, then place the, the, the utensil back on top again. Really, really efficient. That's still burning and I've not needed to put any more fuel on it whatsoever. I barely needed to take the, the utensil off the stove other than those reasons that I've just mentioned. So really, really, really efficient. If you wonder what she's up to, she's not eating the food as such, but the, the butter that I casually tossed that then soaked into the mud and became a buttery, muddy, gritty substance. Yeah, that, that's what she's eating. I mean, she's a Labrador, what did you expect? But I imagine once I start diving into this omelette, she's probably gonna become my new best friend again until I've finished it. So let's dive into the omelette. Just as I'm, as I'm hacking this up, I should say at this point, if you've enjoyed this video, if you like the look of my channel and you'd like to see more from my channel and you're not yet a subscriber, then click on that subscribe button, let me do the rest and you'll be notified of any future video updates. Cheers. Now, now the marketing's done, let's dive into this. Mmm. Tastes like a um, cheese and ham omelette, right? It's, I mean, it's a cheese and ham omelette. What, what were you expecting me to come out with? Very nice. Yes, the dog is going to get some. She's not going to get a lot. She's got to watch her figure, but she's going to get some. I would normally feed her before I eat, which for any dog behaviourists out there, it's probably, you're probably shuddering at the thought of that. You should always feed yourself before the dog. Having worked with dogs, <laughs> oh hello. Having worked with dogs overseas in Afghanistan, and mostly in Afghanistan, not really in Iraq, then um, I don't know. There's an, there's an adage in the military about always feed your blokes, always, always feed your soldiers before yourself. If you're in a position of authority, always make sure that your lads are looked after before you eat. And we used to, um, we used to extend that, that ethos to the dogs that we were working with as well, hey? Okay? Good girl. Oh, it's still too hot for you. I'm not being greedy. I promise, I promise you will get some. I promise you. In fact, I'll capture it on camera. All right, I'm saying it on camera now so that there's some evidence of this. I promise I will give the dog some once it's cooled down. Yes, I will. Very nice, it is too. So I'm not going to keep the camera rolling. I'm not going to keep the, the video rolling whilst you watch me eat this. Gonna finish this off and let's check out the hot chocolate and see uh, see what the rate of flow is with this stove. Cheers. Oh yes, a rolling boil to end all rolling boils. That'll do nicely for me. Let's just get this off the fire. And we can still see down in there. Yeah. That, that, that. Yeah, there's still plenty enough heat in there, I would suggest, for probably not another hot chocolate and an omelette, but definitely one or the other. 
So if you're sharing the omelette with somebody, not the dog, but another human, then one of you could easily have a second hot drink from that heat there. Plenty still going. While I'm doing all this filming and editing and sewing things up and all of that, she's nowhere to be seen. I'm calling her, I'm yelling her, I'm panicking, I'm shaking a treat box. She comes running out of the, the wilderness. Look at it now, Willow. Look at it now. Now there's food on the go. So, for those of you that needed the evidence, sit, sit, oh, good girl. Give us a kiss. Give us a kiss. Good girl. There you go. I've admonished my responsibilities now. I think she approves. Let's take a look at this hot chocolate. One heiser chocolade. Oh, hot chocolate if you don't speak pidgin German like I do. I'm going to edit this video so that you can actually see the, the, the waste, the ash signature that's left at the end of this. I've not added any more fuel to that now. I'm just going to let it burn down. I'm going to let physics do its thing. And uh, you're seeing on the screen now just what was left at the end of, of this particular video from, a, from a, a signature, from a waste perspective. And as you can see, it's, it's just a few pieces of ash. There's no sort of dog ends. There's no um, you've got burnt dogs, burnt ends, not, not literally burnt dogs. I didn't mean it as in the, the canine dog. I just mean the sort of the dog ends of the logs. There's none of that. It's just ash that can easily just be kicked to one side once it's cooled down or distributed once it's cooled down by hand. Very, very, very economical. Everything, everything gets burned, unlike many open fires where you're left with the ends of logs to deal with. If you've enjoyed this video, if you've enjoyed taking a look at the success with today's stove here, I'm linking to a video up in this corner of the screen now where I take this out on a far more wet and miserable day than today is, although it's starting to rain now, and I look at how I can use, or if I can use, pine cones instead of twigs and small branches in that. So if you're interested in that, check that video out. If not, I'll see you in the next video very shortly. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Take care, folks.